And we are live on Facebook. Good evening, everybody. My name is Travis Randolph. I am the current president of the Wilkie D. Ferguson Junior Bar Association, and I would like to thank you and welcome you to our panel, Can They See Mercy? This is our discussion uh, between the legal community and law enforcement leaders in South Florida regarding the themes that have been displayed on the film, Just Mercy and When They See Us. I would like to thank everyone for being here today. I would like to recognize our voluntary bar associations who are also present here tonight. I would like to recognize the Gwen S. Cherry Black Women Lawyers Association, the Day County Bar Association, the Virgil Hawkins Florida Chapter of the National Bar Association, the National Black Prosecutors Association. We also have with us here tonight, we have UPAC, we have the Asian Lawyers Association, we have the Caribbean Bar Association, we have the Circle of Brotherhood, and we have the Black Advisory, the Black Ministry Advisory Panel here tonight as well. Thank you for all of uh, our community leaders for joining us here today. Uh, our discussion will begin with our panelists, whom I'm going to interview, I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment. But first, I'd like to give a shout out to the NAACP, the Miami Dade branch, the South Dade branch, and also the Broward County branches. I'd also like to recognize the National Panhellenic Organization who are joined us here today. That would include Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. That would also include Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. We have with us Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. We have Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We have Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. We have Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. And we also have Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated and the Soror uh, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Thank you all for joining here tonight. Um, I do always give a special recognition to my brothers of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, but do with that as you will. Our panelists here tonight will be leading our discussion on the themes that are found in the two films, Just Mercy and also When They See Us. Um, most of you who are out in our community know our panelists and you know their accolades. I am going to give you a short introduction to these panelists so that we can get on with our discussion here today. Our first panelist is Ms. L'Oreal R. Scott. She is an attorney here in Miami-Dade, Florida. She's also the immediate past president of the Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. Bar Association, and she is um, one of the panelists tonight. Our second panelist is Rodney Jacobs. You may know him as the assistant director for the city of Miami civilian investigative panel. He's also been involved in passing the CIP for the uh, Miami-Dade County as well. We also have with us Chief Delma Noel Pratt, who is the chief of police for the city of Miami Gardens. Um, she has been one of the bright shining stars here in Miami-Dade County, and we are happy to have her with her tonight. We also have the iconic, the heroic, um, Mr. H.T. Smith. He is one of the founders of the Wilkie D. Ferguson Junior Bar Association. He was one of the leaders of the Boycott Miami movement, and we're happy to have him with us tonight. And last, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Don Horn. Many of you have um, met him and talked with him and spoke with him. He is the Chief Assistant State Attorney for Miami-Dade County. He has been an active member of our community and we are happy to have him with us here tonight. And now I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Debria Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Chovis. Um, we would like to welcome you all here tonight. My name is Debria Bradshaw. I am the founder and president of Debs Foundation, and I will be co-moderating this event tonight with Mr. Jamal May, who is the executive director of the Albert Wilson Foundation. Um, we will do in a more in-depth um, introduction of the panelists, and Jamal will go ahead and introduce Mrs. Loria R. Scott. Great, thank you, Debria. As Debria mentioned, my name is Jamal May, Executive Director of the Albert Wilson Foundation, founded by Miami Dolphins wide receiver, Albert Wilson. So I have the pleasure of kicking off this panel discussion, introducing uh, you all to Ms. L'Oreal 
A. R. Scott. Gloria received a Bachelor's of Art in both Political Science and English while minoring in Psychology from Florida State University. In 2006, she received her Juris Doctorate from the University of Florida's Levin College of Law. In 2019, Ms. R. Scott formed the LA Law Firm, PA, where she specializes in civil litigation, municipal law, real estate, land use, and zoning. Prior to launching her firm, Ms. R. Scott worked in the municipal sector at the City of Miami Gardens, where she served as the Assistant City Attorney and the Director of Office of Civic Engagement. Ms. R. Scott has also served as a litigation attorney and corporate law department of a major insurance company, primarily practicing insurance defense. Ms. R. Scott initially dedicated her practice to family and dependency law, serving for several years as a program attorney for the Guardian Ad Litem Program, and as Division Chief of Florida's Department of Children and Family Children and Families, Children's Legal Services. Ms. R. Scott has served as, has served as a pro bono attorney and attorney ad litem for dependency cases since she left the area of practice in 2014. Welcome and thank you for joining us, L'Oreal. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Don Horn, who is the Chief Assistant State Attorney for Administration, State Attorney's Office, 11th Judicial Circuit. Don L. Horn received his law degree from the University of Miami and was admitted to the Florida Bar in 1982. Mr. Horn has been admitted to practice in the United States District Court for the Southern, Southern District of Florida, is a former member of the Florida Bar Board of Governors, American Bar Association, and National Bar Association. In 2002, Mr. Horn started a second tour of duty as the State Attorney's Office, where he now serves as Chief Assistant State Attorney for Administration to State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle. His present duties and responsibilities involve handling administrative matters affecting the more than 300 prosecutors in the office. Mr. Horn also handles recruitment and hiring of lawyers, training, all matters involving the Miami-Dade County Grand Jury, and he directly supervises the assistant state attorneys who work in the county courts, legal division, mental health, human trafficking, and misdemeanor and felony domestic violence units. In addition, he represents the office in various community business and civic meetings. Mr. Horn returned to the state attorney's office in March 2002 after spending 12 years in private practice. Prior to his involvement in civil practice, Mr. Horn served as the first African-American major crimes prosecutor in the history of the state attorney's office of the 11th Judicial Circuit of Florida. Thank you for joining us tonight, Mr. Horn. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing you all to Rodney Jacobs. Rodney serves as the Assistant Director, City of Miami Civilian Investigative Panel. Rodney W. Jacobs Jr. is the Assistant Director for the City of Miami Civilian Investigative Panel, also known as CIP. The Civil Investigative Panel is a civilian oversight committee tasked with investigating abusive police practices within the City of Miami. Some of his responsibilities include overseeing investigate, investigations and community relations slash policing initiatives. Mr. Jacobs hails from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He received his Bachelor's of, Bachelor's of Arts degree in Political Sciences from Hiram College, master's degree in public health and public administration from the University of Miami, Florida, and doctorate of Juris Presidents, uh, Prudence from the University of Dayton in Ohio. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Rodney. Thanks for having me guys, looking forward to this conversation. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Chief Delma K. Noel Pratt. She is the police chief of the city of Miami Gardens Police Department. Chief Pratt is an accomplished police executive with 27 years of sworn law enforcement experience. She began her career as a public service aide for the Miami Police Department in 1989. In 1993, she transitioned to the Miami Dade Police Department where she trained and graduated as a police officer. She moved up through the ranks and in February, 2013, she was appointed to division chief. She has directed and coordinated numerous multi-agency entity operations, focusing on violent part one crime reduction. On May 1st, 2017, Chief Noel Pratt was sworn in as the first female police chief for the city of Miami Gardens Police Department. Her vision includes working in partnership with citizens in various community, 
civic organizations within the city to reduce crime and increase quality of life within the city, as well as equipping personnel with the tools needed to stay safe and properly serve, service the community effectively and efficiently. Her educational background consists of an Associates of Arts degree from Miami Dade Community College, Bachelor of Science degree and Legal Assistant Certificate from Barry University, as well as a Master of Science degree from Lynn University. She attended the Broward Sheriff's Office Executive Leadership Program, and she is a graduate of the Federal Bureau of Investigation National Academy, NA245. She has received numerous awards and is a member of the Progressive Officers Club, National Organization of Black Law Executives, FBI National Academy Alumni, and the Miami-Dade County Association of Chief Chiefs of Police, where she currently serves on the board. Welcome, Chief Pratt. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, where we just learned that pressure is a privilege, I have the honor, <laughs> the honor of introducing you to H.T. Smith. H.T. has developed his, or had devoted his entire legal career to agitating for justice. In a letter to the National Bar Association, South African President Nelson Mandela wrote, we join your members in paying special tribute to your retiring president, H.T. Smith, whose name became well known for his consistent and courageous contribution and support for the struggle of our people against apartheid. We wish H.T. well. We are confident that wherever injustice and racism raises their ugly head, H.T. will be there to raise his powerful voice of protest and resistance. Upon graduation from Florida A&M University in 1968 with a bachelor's degree in mathematics, H.T. was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. From 1969 to 1970, he led men in combat in the jungles of Vietnam. H.T. earned his law degree in 1973 and later served as one of the lead attorneys in the successful legal challenge to Ward Connolly's efforts to pass a constitutional amendment outlawing affirmative action in public education, public employment, and public contracting. In his argument to the Florida Supreme Court, H.T. described Connolly's so-called civil rights initiative as a, crucial, as a cruel hoax on the people of Florida. H.T. was one of the founding presidents of the Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. Bar Association and a founding member of the Gwen S. Cherry Black Women Lawyers Association. He also served as president of the Virgil Hawkins Florida chapter of the National Bar Association and the National, and the National Bar Association, which is the oldest and largest bar association for people of color in America. Thank you and welcome H.T. Smith. Thank you. Episode one of When They See Us explores how the arrest interrogation process denied the exonerated five their human rights and humanity. And now we'll have a clip. And how many times did he slap you? Three times. And what did you do? I just took him serious. I had no choice but to take him serious because Hardy can't say I could go home if I said I was at the rape. You didn't want to say it, but you did. Why did you say something that wasn't true, Corey? They said, they said if I was there and if I went along with it, that I could go home. And that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted, was to go home. That's all I still want. No. Um, Travis is going to give a few more shout outs to some dignitaries in the audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bria. We have reckon we would like to recognize uh, judges who have come in to the uh, audience today. We have Judge Fred Serafin. We have Judge Jason Demetrius. We have Judge Maisha Darrow. We have Judge Robert Watson. We have Judge Scott Janowitz. We have Judge Tom Rebull. We have Judge Marsha Cook. 
And I believe that we have Magistrate Lorna Brown Burton in the audience as well. We would like to recognize them and thank them also for appearing with us tonight. The exonerated five and their families faced a system that did not allow parents to witness the questioning of their children ages 14 to 16. They gave police what gave police leeway to question children for multiple hours without parental presence or legal representation. Allowed and still allows police to lie to criminal suspects and families can assert their power when they learn the ins and outs of America's criminal justice system. Bias also played a, a role in this case. Bias by the media is real and tangible. Racial bias in reporting is dehumanizing to many African-Americans and Latinos. Next, we'll show an ad that was referenced in the movie. This ad was referenced many times in the movie um, as something that was taken out by Donald Trump, which called for the death penalty for the exonerated five. Now, my first question to the panelists are, how do we educate our communities on the criminal justice system? How do we start this as early as the ages of the young men that were affected by this case, which was the age of 14? And anyone can jump in. Well, uh, go ahead, uh, Chief. I saw you raise your hand. Um, from a police standpoint, uh, uh, something that we do currently right now is we have what's called the uh, Police Explorer Program, which helps to uh, bring light to our youth as far as what our, what's entailed in our criminal justice system. In addition, as it relates to uh, the adults in the community, we have what's called the Citizens Academy. Um, that allows a few weeks of educating uh, individuals in the community as to why we do certain things. Uh, we go over uh, the legalities of uh, different things that we come across. We go over uh, and even place them in various scenarios. If certain things were to happen, how we would react as, the, as police officers. Um, in addition, um, one thing that I like to do is I like to ensure that um, my officers are very proactive in the community. I don't want it to be where our officers only go to various locations based on issues of concerns, but instead, instead, instead we engage uh, various members of the community in order to develop that dialogue and let them know that we're here for them and that we want to work in partnership with them. And also another thing that we do is we employ a lot of uh, individuals on our police force that actually live in the community because I feel it's important that we are uh, representative of the people that we serve. So I, I think all those things that we're doing is very important and it should be across the board in a lot of various police departments. Well, as uh, Will Smith said, racism is not getting worse. Racism is just getting filmed. People in the black community have been seeing this for 401 years. Please understand that anything that I say does not, is not an indictment of everybody. There are good people who are police officers, good people who are judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, all through the system. But this idea that there are a few rotten apples is misplaced. The orchard is rotten. So you have a good police officer who wants to do the right thing. And he sees another police officer or she sees another police officer do something bad and report them. And then they're in a tight situation. They call for backup. They might not have another police officer come to back them up. Next, the question is what should we do? George Floyd sadistically suffocated over eight minutes and 46 seconds. Arthur McDuffie, skull cracked like an egg here in Miami. Alpheus Daly, black man in Miami, paralyzed from the waist down, shot through the back four times. And recently, I have a lot of more names, Jacob Blake, shot four times, seven times in the back in front of his three children. 
So now the ghost of Charles Hamilton Houston is speaking to black lawyers. He's saying you're either a social engineer or you're a parasite. Of course, our community needs to know how to interact with the police. There is nothing we can do that will eliminate all police misconduct, just like the police officer, the chief, can't eliminate all crime. That's why we have the police. But we can do something. And I challenge black lawyers, just as you organize, we organize the JDI to promote ourselves to become judges, we need to start a street law clinic and go, go uh, zip code by zip code where we train the activists, people like in Black Lives Matter and other organizations that are out in the street. They need to know that when a police officer pulls you over, you put your hands on the wheel. You don't go searching in your glove compartment because you're gonna get shot. We need to teach them uh, uh, where they can take photographs and where they can't. We need to teach them that you're trying to protect yourself because someone calls. You take that call if you want to. That's a crime in the state of Florida. There are a lot of things that we can teach and we can also have podcasts. We can have forums like this that the Wilkie D. Ferguson Bar Association and others have, have, uh, have, have organized. You know, every January we hear from the media, I have a dream that my little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I believe that if we control the media, we would hear this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. America is a society poisoned to its soul by racism. You don't hear that one, do you? Because we don't control the media. That's much more relevant than content of the character because content of character is nothing more than merit. Merit should not even be, you shouldn't even ask, have to ask for merit. Merit should come with the territory. Thank you. If I can follow up uh, on HT's comments, uh, one of the things that has happened, I think one of the benefits of this whole COVID uh, pandemic is that folks have become familiar with this platform. And we are gonna be reaching more people tonight than we ever would have been able to reach if we held this in some civic auditorium or some other public uh, community uh, place. I have a whole uh, stable of prosecutors who get involved in career days and ethnic governance days. They're involved in the uh, law magnet programs at the school. They're serving as judges and, and, and advisors uh, to kids who want to be involved in law and more specifically who may think about uh, being prosecutors. And unfortunately, it's programs and, and movies like these two that are the subject of this discussion that gives all of us as prosecutors, uh, we get painted with the bad brush and paint it in the same light. This is what prosecutors do. And the prosecutors in both of these movies failed miserably. They did not uphold their obligation to do what they should do as prosecutors. And one of the things that we do uh, in our office with getting our attorneys out there in the communities, going out to community meetings, going out uh, and, and speaking with community activists, having meetings in our office with uh, uh, folks in the faith community uh, and, and, and educators, going out to the law schools is educating them on the specifics of what it is that we do, what our obligation is, what our responsibilities are, what the law is. And I think that helps. Uh, education is power. That's the way I view it. Knowledge is power. And those are some of the things that we do. Even in our churches, we've got a justice ministry. So we can educate the members in our uh, flocks, in our congregations, to let them know what the law is and what they can expect and what powers uh, they have should they find themselves in these situations. Absolutely. Absolutely. Education is the key. I believe L'Oreal uh, quoted a couple weeks ago that our, my people perish due to a lack of knowledge. Um, so education is, is critical. Rodney, I believe you had a point that you want to make. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important. And um, I think Chief said a lot of great things um, and I really admire her work. And I don't say that to be gratuitous, I really mean it. She's done great work in Miami Gardens. 
Uh, but one of the things I can say, knowing that is Miami Gardens and how she runs her police department is in some ways the exception to the rule uh, for the national standard of policing, uh, which is the sad reality of it. Uh, going back to the to the initial question of, you know, how do we educate our youth? Uh, one thing that I'm often saying, and it's something that we saw a little bit in both of the films, is that you should do as much as you can as a black person to survive the encounter with police officers in the street. And obviously that takes a good amount of training and insight, not only from our parents, but others that work in the law enforcement uh, sections. But thereafter, after you arrive to wherever you're going alive, whether that's prison, whether that's uh, to your home, uh, that is where you start to fight your battles in those mediums, in the courtrooms. Uh, uh, there, thereafter, after you, um, you know, requested your attorney, I think all of us probably watched that film and be like, just stop talking. Like, you know, say you want your attorney. Now, although that might not have got them where they needed to be, but that is that is what we need to educate on. We need to show people how to assert those rights when they're in those spaces and not on the street. Uh, because the main thing is if you don't survive that encounter on the street, uh, it makes it a lot harder to defend you in, in the courtrooms. Uh, I think right now what we're seeing is the critical thinking around criminal justice and that these things aren't just uh, criminal justice issues, but they're healthcare issues as well. Um, I think HC hit the nail on the head when you talked about how we paint America uh, using I have a dream speech. And I think if we controlled that narrative, we probably would also bring up probably the first two sentences that MLK said in his I have a dream speech where, which was, you know, in, in the symbolic uh, shadows we stand of our forefathers, we sign a check that can't be returned. Uh, MLK was talking about promises there. He was talking about the promises America has made to black and brown people of this country. Those promises were in the forms of laws and rights. And we need to remind people of those laws and rights every time we have encounters to the promises America has oftentimes given us an empty check. Thank, thank you, Rodney. Thank you. And I think our next question follows up on a lot of things that uh, all of you all have mentioned in, in your initial responses. So one thing we've seen in the media a lot is comply or die. Comply or die. That's been a big thing. So uh, what do we need to know about encounters with police officers? Because we've seen time and time where people comply and are still assaulted or even worse, kill. So adding on to what you just said, Rodney, or anyone else can chime in. What else do we need to know about police encounters? So I'll actually jump in um, on this one first, uh, Jamal, thank you. So you kind of took my one liner that I was gonna open with uh, in response to the last question. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. I wish I could claim the um, credit for that phrase, but of course I can't, it's biblical. So it, there is definitely something to that. I think you heard from the chief, you heard from HT, you heard from Don, and of course Rodney in regards to all of the wonderful programming that our law enforcement have in place but the issue is that that programming is not translating to the community, right? So how do we get that information to the community? How do we ensure that our youth, mostly our youth are aware of their rights and how they should encounter police officers? That's where the social engineers, as HT just mentioned, where the talented 10th come in. Those of us who have the knowledge, who have the uh, information, it's incumbent upon us to then disseminate that information to our community at large. We're given this position of privilege, uh, privilege use it usually for a reason. And with that privilege comes certain uh, power and expectations, right? Privilege is not fair, but it is incumbent upon us to then disseminate that information to our youth. So one of the things that we can start doing is unfortunately having that conversation very early. And we saw that from when they see us, right? As a mother, it pains me to say that we probably need to have that conversation with our elementary school students. And should I dare say middle school students? This, the kids in that video were 14 years old. Can you imagine? Son, when you meet a police officer, this is what you do. As HT said, okay, when you're in the car, you put your hands on the steering wheel. But if my son is hanging out with his friends, son, don't run away from the police officers. Stand still, look at them in their eye, talk respectfully to them. I, just enacting that conversation is way too much for me right now. And I don't even wanna think about it. But those are conversations that we need to have with our children now in order to prepare them for how they should encounter police officers. Because Jamal, you're right, and back to your question, even when we do all of the things that we're supposed to do, we still might not necessarily walk away from that situation. So if we are armed with the knowledge, if we're respectful to law enforcement, then we pray that we encounter it 
in a different way. I think the better question to ask is kind of back to the chief's point, how do we ensure that the proper police personnel is encountering our youth? So let's flip that question. How do we ensure that outside of Miami Gardens, other districts, city of Miami, are actually hiring their residents? How do we ensure that the police department accurately reflects the community it serves? Just like we've been touting that mantra for judicial diversity, the diversity. Are we touting the same mantra for diversity on law enforcement? How are we ensuring that all law enforcement is receiving implicit bias training on a consistent basis that they need? That they're receiving training on de-escalation on a consistent basis? that all of these calls for reforms that we've previously asked for are being implemented on a consistent basis. That when the chief walks the streets with her coffee with the cops and she's at Walmart with her police officers, that children are not running in the other way, but they understand that this is officer friendly and that they know law enforcement is actually there to protect them. Those are the conversations that we need to have. And by doing more forums like this and actually getting out in the communities and getting out into the schools, that's how we disseminate that information. And, and our children uh, need to know also just how much danger they may be in. First of all, we must remember that police departments were only formed for the purpose of protecting white slave owners from a possible black slave result, revolt. And that, that was the only reason for the police being a form at that time. And then in 1850, as all of you know, the Fugitive Slave Act was then passed so that people from the South, if slaves were fortunate enough to run away, white vigilantes could go get them. That's, the, that's what happened with Ahmaud Arbery, the white vigilantes. This, this black kid has the nerve to come running through our community. Are you serious? We'll take care of this. And so they must, in other words, we must teach our children to see it from the, that perspective, from the police officer's perspective, they must know that most police officers, not the chief Dell, I mean, that's the, she's the exception, but too many white police officers see if Don Horn and I were together with a t-shirt and shorts and sneakers, they would be, police would be afraid of us. I have been arrested, not arrested, but detained three times by the South Miami Police Department once, North Miami Beach Police Department, and the Miami-Dade Police Department, which at the time I was their lawyer. So I, I wanna say three quick things because I, there are people here that wanna learn. Please look, look for the 2006 report on white supremacist infiltration of law enforcement. The 2015 FBI counterterrorism policy guide, which showed that skinheads, and members of the Ku Klux Klan had a plan, have a plan to infiltrate police departments all over this country and to disguise themselves. And it is extremely successful all over this country. And when around the time that Don, I'm about nine years before Don, just before Don became a prosecutor, we start seeing in the homicide reports the letters NHI, and we didn't have computers then, so we would put all our, our reports together and try to figure out. And we started seeing NHI, why does this come up in these homicide reports? And we finally saw that NHI only appeared in deaths where the victim was black. And so we, what the hell does this mean? So we put the police officers under oath and they finally had to tell us that NHI means no humans involved. That was in the 70s and the 80s. Check Google, for those of you Google, Google Judge Green, Broward County, 2006. The chief of the Broward County uh, uh, Criminal Court. In 2006, a prosecutor lost a case and he was crying. The judge says, why are you all upset? This is an NHI in 2006. And I will bet my bar card today that there are judges on the bench in federal and state court 
who believe that, but just smart enough not to say it. And so our children need to know that. If they know that they're possibly dealing with a Klansman, if they know the history of how the police department has been used, it will be a different kind of attitude. They think, well, he's a police officer or she's a police officer, but you know, she's got rules and regulations to follow. I got constitutional rights. Well, as Rodney Jacobs said, we'll fight that after you successfully stay alive after your encounter with the police officer. Thank you. Jamal, the, the, the question is, is, is critical uh, for, for our survival. And to give some context before I answer your question, uh, following the murder of George Floyd, uh, the state attorney felt it would be beneficial for us to have what we called healing hours. And on a virtual platform, state attorney, myself, and other folks tried to provide a forum so that people in our office who were hurting, grieving, uh, frustrated, uh, black prosecutors trying to figure out whether this was the right place for them uh, as prosecutors, we had a forum where people could vent, they could share their painful stories about what it was like being black in America. And we shared and we cried. We opened up that first segment with the video of that young black boy singing that song he made up, I Just Want to Live. I'm sure everybody's seen it. After he finished singing that, this is what I read to everybody who was on the platform. And I'm gonna try and hopefully make it through this without breaking up because I haven't done it yet. Christine Zorobin, one of my attorneys sent this to me. We cooperate, we die. We run, we die. We fight back, we die. We beg, we die. We lie down, we die. We put our hands up, we die. We mind our own business, we die. We're unarmed, we die. We're detained, we die. Tell us what are we supposed to do to keep the cops from killing us? And that's the reality because Breonna Taylor is lying in the bed and she's dead. But notwithstanding that's our reality, what I told my kids and what I try to do in any police encounter, I'm going to do to whatever extent I can, whatever I can to try to make sure this officer understands that I am not a threat to you. And it may be something as simple as I got pulled over one night in Miami Gardens leaving church. Uh, I saw the lights pulled over wound down the windows, all four windows, uh, so they can see clearly into the car. When I spoke to my uh, niece some uh, sometime after, who's law enforcement, she said, well, did you turn on your dome light? I says, no, but I will know to do that the next time because there is no such thing as a routine traffic stop for a black person in America, nor is there such a thing as a routine traffic stop for a law enforcement officer in America, because we have prosecuted folks who got pulled over by the police, jumped out with assault weapons and started shooting at the police before the police officers even knew what was going on. So it's an uncomfortable situation for everybody. So if you find yourself in that situation, do what Rodney said, do whatever you can to try to make sure you're going to survive that encounter. If there are any illegalities, if there's an abusive use of force, deal with that later, which is what I told my kids. If the police tell you to do something, do it. Even if he's flat out wrong, I will fight it later. But I want you to make it home OK. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. You had something else to chime in at. Yeah, the thing I was going to say is strictly from the uh, perspective of policing and at least how we see it um, in oversight, uh, there's a lot of different uh, messaging around and narratives around what policing should be and what it should incorporate, whether it's uh, implicit bias training or de-escalation training and things of that nature. And, I, and I'm sure Chief can opine as well that there's not a lot of in-service time to train in those ways in which that are effective, in an effective way that would help someone really change the core of their being and operate differently. You know, I'm of the opinion that in certain instances, when we're talking about de-escalation, which, you know, just more on one's own mental resilience in the way they just orchestrate themselves in general. And when they have a bias that these things should be pre-screening measures, that they should be measures that determine if someone should be hired as a police officer to begin with. 
When we talk about implicit bias training, if we can find someone that can do it effectively in the right way, that police officer that attends that training may figure out that they do have an implicit bias. But then what happens next, Jamal? That person probably then goes to operate with their implicit bias. Now that implicit bias is just explicit, right? They're not gonna lose their job um, in, in large part because unions will ensure that they retain their job, right? So in these situations, when we're as a community, when we're giving deliberate asks on what we think are important, uh, we have to be sure that we're critical in what these asks will be because in some situations, they will have us more, I mean, worse off than better off. When we look at implicit bias and we look at uh, people that may have explicit prejudices and things of that nature, these are things that can be identified in the pre-screen measures when officers are being hired. And we need to start thinking about how we envision policing to be more customer service oriented than military force oriented. When we talk about the situations that Don and HG bring up um, in so far as uh, uh, traffic stops, do we really need to conduct traffic stops the way that we do? Uh, some of these things that we've been talking about a lot in so far as asking the questions on why does this happen or how does that, that happen? We've been asking them in the context of the things that are already existing. Instead, we need to get to the root cause of solving these issues and not solving the symptoms of the issues. And a lot of these things are institutional. We have to change the institutional phrases of this. And I think uh, uh, departments like mine and oversight help police departments understand what these things are and how to indicate them effectively and efficiently. So I think once we get on the same page about those things and realize that we're on the same team, let me tell you, I sit in front of police chiefs every single day and all of them can tell me, Rodney, I don't want bad police officers either. They keep me up at night. I may lose my job. I think we're all on the same team about these things of what we don't want in our communities. We just have to figure out how to do it and how to eradicate it. And I think we're getting close to that. And I think there's hope on the other end of that, on those sentences. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're rolling. A lot of great information. HT educating us, giving us some homework to do. Don educating us, giving us personal experience. Rodney telling us. Uh, I just want to remind that everyone listening, whether uh, via Zoom or Facebook Live, feel free to submit your questions in the chat and we'll have um, our panelists get to them and answer them. Debria, you wanna take us into our next part. Yeah, so in both of these cases that are explained in both films, Just Mercy with Walter McMillan and The Exonerated Five and When They See Us, media plays a huge role and we see that till today. A lot of these cases that we're talking about are referencing to in our answers with Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, these cases were talked about on Twitter. That's where the uproar came from with a lot of these cases. And then we started seeing the mainstream media picking up these cases once the, once the protests start. So how do we, or how does power and wealth impact access to the media? And I'll reference something in one of the films, um, Yusuf's mother, um, wanted to leverage the media. She wanted to garner public attention and outcry to shine a light on the injustices that her son suffered. And she also used the media um, as a bargaining chip to access her son into in, the interrogation room. And for people that have not seen the film, Yusuf was the only um, person from the Exonerated Five that was not interrogated too long by the police. His mom came and took him out. She told the police, my son is only 15. Um, he's not supposed to be questioned without a, without a parent or a legal guardian present. So how do we power and power, how does power and wealth impact access to the media and how can we use it um, to tell our stories accurately? I think uh, power and wealth uh, plays a, a great deal in that. And we saw that in Just Mercy as well. I think Brian Stevenson really leveraged that in the 60 Minutes interview um, that really showed the story of a lot of the death row people that he was representing. I, I think it's critically important that we use any mechanism within our wheelhouse to ensure that we control the narrative. Because if we don't, we can almost guarantee that someone else will. Um, and that white noise can really distract from the overall issue. Uh, right now, we have a almost a, a hyper- a sensationalized society where we're always taking in so much information as possible. Uh, just today, I mean, even I guess this week, I should say, uh, we, we've heard more information about uh, the incidents that happened in Rochester, New York, uh, with an individual who has alleged to have mental issues and passed away in custody uh, and thereafter. So there's so much that we can have at, at our own fingertips that it's, it's almost imperative. Because it would almost be um, unresponsible for us not to control that narrative in some way uh, with the mechanisms we have. And I think that tool and resource 
has really almost added gasoline on the necessary change uh, that we're all have been striving for. Uh, a lot of the same things that we're talking about right now, I'm sure Don and HT have been talking about it over and over again. We're not saying anything unique. People have been fighting these same things for almost 100 years plus, which is the agonizing uh, reality of it. Uh, so none of these things are new. I'm sure people that have PhDs, thesis, have written on these things for 50 years ago are talking about these things now again. The issue is we're just not solving it fast enough, but now we at least have some additional mediums that allow us to do it more efficiently. Well, I, Don, go ahead, Don. Debria, I, I think one of the things that has happened recently with all of the social media platforms, money is not as significant as it was in 1989 when the incident happened with these five boys. What do I mean by that? Someone with a cell phone can film something and it's all the way around the world in minutes. And the message in that image is now out there. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. If I were to call the press conference, nobody would have shown up, but I've now put this on my Facebook page and it's got 2 million views. And now the media has picked it up because I've now got access to this platform. And I think that has empowered uh, folks. It has empowered this movement and allowed people who have not had a voice before to now have a voice and have a platform, as it were, maybe even virtual, to be able to get their message out to people who they otherwise would not have been able to speak to. The fact that people were protesting the horrible death of George Floyd across the Atlantic in other countries speaks to this. And I think that uh, it is important to understand that because of the power of the government, controlling the narrative is a very high bar. And as Rodney said, that should be a goal, but very rarely will you be able to control the narrative. What you can do oftentimes is to match the narrative of the government. One of the things that I have problems with, uh, with prosecutors' offices in state and federal, is that they will charge someone with a crime and then they hold a press conference and they talk about how bad the person is. And then when the other side tries to have a press conference, they say oftentimes, Judge, well, you need to muzzle them. Uh, uh, Judge Cook, uh, sign an order. They're talking about the case. Well, that's how you started the damn case by calling the press conference. So how the hell, if you can call a press conference, I can. I had represented a lawyer one time who, who was charged with a crime because she went out and talked to the witness and the prosecutor said, you can't talk to my witness. I went to the Florida Supreme Court and they said, hey, it's not your witness. If the prosecutor can call, talk to the witness, you can too. So one of the problems is that, not problems, one of the challenges is knowing how to message, how to use the media and now, as Don has said, you don't need a lot of money. I've been privileged to represent uh, athletes. Entertainers, my favorite all time is Dion Warwick. Trust me, I get much quicker access to the media when I say I'm calling about Dion Warwick than I say I'm calling about Johnny Campbell, whoever he is. So money and power definitely always has an advantage in America. Don't make no mistake about it. And that transcends race and gender and language. So what we need to do though is in terms of this street academy, this street law academy that I'm gonna challenge us to do, all of this is a part of messaging, uh, of, of, of knowing your rights and being the exercise. See, having rights mean nothing if you don't know what they are. There are people out in the street filming and please tell them, put that camera away. You have a right. If you're in a public place, you can film all you want to. If you're on private property, now that's different. You got to get permission. And so uh, this this uh, idea of media, media is like nitroglycerin. My grandmother used to take a nitroglycerin tablet before a heart attack, and it saved her life. But nitroglycerin can also be a bomb. And so using the media, you better know what you're doing because you can hurt your client if you don't use it right, proper messaging. When, when Jacob Blake got sh shot, I said, 
I hope the first words out of their mouth is in the back. I don't care if it was one shot or seven shots in the back and in front of his children. That's the right message. So I would see these reports on TV. He was shot seven times by the police. I got a visual. My visual was that he was facing the police and maybe he had a gun in his hand. I don't know. But when you say shot seven times in the back in front of three small children, you then at least match the narrative that the police are going to come out. When my client who was shot in the back four times in a wheelchair and the police said, well, he had a gun. Well, they searched for three hours. They say they found the gun 23 feet away from him. Three hours later, I, fought, I had the gun fingerprinted, had the bullets fingerprinted. Guess what? His fingerprints weren't on it. Of course they weren't. You got to be able to match the narrative of the other side. And you got to know what you're doing in terms of messaging. And, and the messaging, the government is taught how to message, just like police are taught how to testify. And so you got to understand that. Look, I would love if I, all my encounters were with Judge, uh, with Chief Pratt, but I got a feeling I'm not going to ever be in a position where she's going to arrest me or come into contact with me in a negative way. We'll be working on something. I'm going to come into contact with that guy who got into the police department as a Ku Klux Klansman or skinhead and has not told anybody that's what he's doing. And he's looking to take out his racial animus with the power and authority of the entire government backing him with the union and the police officer's bill of rights. We need to get into that too. Thank you. And, and also to on that note, the, the energy and what's ever trending at that time is what's gonna impact the access to the media. Um, just right now, I mean, uh, police brutality is, is what's trending right now. And as much or as more conversation is talked about this, um, you're going to have media always constantly looking for their avenue into that topic. So it's not really that I don't think it's really the, the power and the, and the wealth. It's more of how many people are pushing that message at that time. Media is going to go ahead and say, well, this is what we need to talk about at this time. And it really depends, it changes. Um, next month, it may be something else, but uh, that's what's really pushing everything. And the social media avenue is the biggest avenue uh, out there right now. It doesn't matter if you're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, whatever's talked about at that moment, it's gonna be on those platforms. So that's the most powerful thing right now that's out there. Absolutely, absolutely, controlling the narrative. Uh, the importance of wording and messages, taking advantage of social media, absolutely. Loria, uh, you wanna chime in? Yes, thank you, Jamal. Um, I think it's really important for us to remember it, kind of like what we just saw from HT and Don, and Don. We are descendants of the master storytellers. Our ancestors were the master storytellers. We are very capable of telling our own story. And we have to make sure that our story gets out there first. Um, this, this is akin to the messaging that you just heard from HT and Don. But in the sense that if we don't control the narrative, if we don't get ahead of the story, then we have to backtrack and start com combating all the dog, dog whistle politics that you know we're going to encounter. So for those of you who saw when they see us, Throughout the film, they call them racist, they call them animals, they call them a gang. There were such buzzwords used to describe these children, but not once did you hear them refer to them as children. And you never heard them refer to them as 14-year-old children, 14-year-old boys. So back to HT's point about the messaging, if we don't get our information out there in an accurate way to tell our story, then we have to backtrack. Uh, of course, I disagree in regards to the situation of wealth in this day and age, but I think some of the other panelists already hit on that. That misconception of wealth and influence controls media long gone are those days. At this time, of course, they have stellar publicists, but everyone with this iPhone in their hand, as Don pointed out, you're your own publicist. All of y'all who are there posting all those stories on Instagram, who post nonstop on Facebook, you're already controlling these same platforms that you can utilize to get your story out there. 
Now the next step is to make sure that you have the proper contacts for the newspapers. And if you know somebody who knows somebody, I'm sure you got those contacts. So we have all the information that we need at hand now. What you may need assistance with is crafting the story and getting the information out there. But if, if wealth and influence kind of got you a little edge in your accessibility, that no longer exists. We need to focus on the dog whistle politics, get in ahead of the story, and making sure that we put our information out there first. And from a police chief's uh, standpoint, uh, if, if Officer A has done something wrong, I, I don't understand why a chief of police is saying Officer A did not do A, B, and C. We need to own up to our mistakes. If there's a mistake that happened, is there something wrong that happened that we need to own up to it? Just the same way that if something is explainable, we need to explain it to the community. I think that's what they expect and that's what we should do as, as leaders in this community. A lot of times um, you have leaders that are fearful or they're trying to um, change the narrative in the wrong manner. Um, if your officer did something wrong, then you need to state officer A did such and such wrong and advise that you don't tolerate and condone that behavior because after all, it's, it starts from the top on down. So you need to make sure that you're the, the right kind of leader that's going ahead and you making sure that you're pushing that message out, but you don't condone certain things that are happening out there and, and speak up what's wrong out there. And, and, and that, you're I'm good. sorry, go ahead, Rodney. Oh, I, I was going to say uh, two things. First thing is, um, and HC had mentioned this as well, we need to obviously uh, tell our kids, our, our families, the rights, but we also need to ensure that police officers know the law as well. I, I can't tell you how many times uh, there's cases in our office where an officer will tell someone, I am arresting you because you disobeyed a lawful order, but the order just wasn't lawful or it wasn't even a law to begin with. You're just upset because maybe you're having an ego trip, right? So obviously we need to do better in informing our officers what the law is and, and and if they don't know then okay maybe you shouldn't do patrol maybe you should do something else uh the next point is and i and i think um the chief is putting it uh, too, too easily on her herself i mean i think obviously there's some disciplinary things that uh chiefs of police can deal with um the way i try to break it down when i'm explaining to the community is like listen if you're upset about police officer misconduct you really have three larger beefs or maybe even four depending on how you parse it if you're upset that a, a police officer did something um, in the line of duty uh, uh, that doesn't necessarily amount to uh, misconduct with a community member, but say if it's like a department of order or, or policy about a, a psychological evaluation or, or a drug test, well, then maybe you should be upset at your chief of police for allowing that department of order or SOP to be on the books. If you're upset that a police officer did something with criminal illegality, uh, a police officer involved shooting, and they're not having their day in court or they're not being brought to justice, well, then maybe you need to call uh, our brother Don Horn here and uh, Catherine Fernandez Rundle to bring us some charges you should be upset at our state attorney. If you're upset at that, at that police officers are getting relieved of duty with pay, or, or they don't have uh, physical fitness evaluations, or they're not getting drug tested, then you need to be upset about uh, at your elected officials. Because more often than not, elected officials are sitting across the table from police union members, presidents, and they're collectively bargaining these kinds of rights into contracts that won't allow or will allow police officers to kind of skirt away some of the things that make you upset. So as a community, we have to understand the nexus of power that will effectuate our change. It does us no good to just yell at uh, Chief Pratt all day when it's not in her power to discipline certain things. And oftentimes, as I said earlier, chiefs of police do want to hold bad officers accountable, but there's state laws and protections that make them make that cumbersome for them to do. One of those things is what HG brought up in the Police Officers' Bill of Rights. Some of it is collective bargaining, and some of it just falls on our state attorneys to ensure justice uh, uh, for, for some of these things that make people upset that we see on the news, that we see on social media. So when looking and understanding those things, and, and, the, and the tricky fourth thing is police unions, which we'll probably get at later, but all of these things need to be conceptualized in a way so that when we organize our efforts to say, we're upset at this thing, we need to make sure we're in the proper ear to change it, not yelling at the chief if she can't do it or yelling at you know uh, 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 the elected leaders. We gotta know what we want and we gotta know how to get it done. And this is why I say, that is the orchard that's rotten. So let's assume that a black person, a man, shoots a, a, a police officer in Miami-Dade County. The police can take that person and question him with as many people as they want to. But if a police officer shot a black man, they they have they can only first of all, 
They can't even question him until they have talked to every other witness. They can't question the police officer until they've given the police officer everybody's statement. They can't question that police officer until they've told him every piece of evidence. The law says they cannot lie to the police officer. But if a black man shoots a cop, they can lie to him. And the United States Supreme Court has said it's okay to lie to him. He can't, he can't, uh, he, he, they don't have to give him any evidence. They don't have to talk, take to other, talk to other witnesses, et cetera. He has a right to have his lawyer present. They, they can't take a statement without a lawyer or representative there. What I'm saying, if you match the rights of us and the rights of the police, they are way out of whack. Even police officers should not be ab above the law. I represented the police officers proudly. It, it, it was called the Public Safety Department, which was the prior name of the Miami-Dade Police Department. I met a hell of a lot of heroic police, but I met some real dangerous clan type police and I reported them. Nothing was done, but my conscience was clear. I had a police officer to evict a person and they had all this furniture put on a truck and taken somewhere and the police officer stole the furniture. The law is that because the, 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 we were doing a favor, county was doing a favor, then we're not, we're not liable. I said, the hell with that. We know that our cop stole the furniture. We're going to pay that man for the furniture. Now, the brother, the, the brother elevated the price of the furniture. <laughs> but the point of the matter is we've got to speak truth to power. The police bill, officer bill of rights is something that, the, that we lawyers need to look at. And to help chiefs like Chief Pratt, we need to look at these bargaining, these uh, collective bargaining agreements. If you won't believe what's in these agreements in terms of the protections and what I consider handcuffs on good uh, chiefs who will discipline if you do wrong and will commend you if you do right. Is that asking too much? Um, next, we'll show another clip from one of the films. I ain't doing this like this. What other way they ever do us? So this leads us to our next question. So unequal access to resources can often result in unequal access to justice. Can you think of an example where unequal access or res uh, think of an example of unequal access to resources in your community. We'll start with uh, Brother Horn. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, talk about, um, for me, one of the most amazing things I ever did as a prosecutor, which was I got a man out of prison who had been in prison for 21 years in Arcadia, Florida. His name is James Joseph Richardson. He was accused of poisoning his seven kids, all who died overnight. He was prosecuted on one of those cases, given the death penalty. The prosecution in that case violated constitutional principles. They violated rules of procedure. Uh, the attorney he had had never handled a death penalty case and was just ill-suited to be handling a case of that magnitude. But again, back in 1968, there was a great cry similar to this case. Something's got to be done. We got seven dead children. Somebody's got to be arrested. He was a black itinerant farmer, no resources, uh, no education. Um, and his lawyer, the uh, fact that he did not have the ability to hire someone who had experience, I think that contributed greatly to what happened with this case, in addition to being a whole bunch of improper police uh, procedures, improper prosecutorial procedures, and we pointed that all out uh, during the course of the invest, uh, uh, executive assignment that was given to Ms. Reno, and she gave it to me, and I investigated it for six months. So this, and this happened in 1989, the same year this was happening, and that is a clear case. He got the death penalty. And but for the U.S. Supreme Court overturning all of the pending death penalties in the country, 
he would have been killed in Florida's electric chair for something that he did not do in something that I proved he could not have done based on what was in the prosecutor's files. And so in that case, just in this one case, we know the failure to have financial resources to get the tools that you need for proper investigation, for proper representation would have resulted in his death, but for the US Supreme Court and but for someone stealing the files and sending to the governor's office saying this man got railroaded 20 years ago, somebody needs to look into this. Absolutely. Chief Pratt, do you have anything to add? Can you give us an example? It goes back to what I stated initially is knowing um, your community and making sure they do have the resources that they need. And if you find out that somebody doesn't have the, um, the, the resources that they need, that you find a way to get them the resources. It just doesn't end when you get to their front door, that you go ahead, you find out what the situation at hand is, and then you just leave them and you don't follow up. There has to be some form of follow-up, whether it be you, you reach out to South Florida uh, Resource Center and say, listen, this gentleman right here needs a job. He has two kids that he's taking care of, and therefore we need to go ahead and help him. It's not just about going there that, for that same day and just dealing with it on that, on that particular day. You have to have follow-up. Loria, anything to add on to that? Yes, so I, the example that I'm gonna give is gonna take us in a little bit of a different uh, direction. I know this panel is talking about justice reform, but one of the things that struck me when watching both of these films is if every bit of the criminal justice system fails or falls apart or misses a mark somewhere, the last best hope should either be the jury, one would think, or the judge. And I would dare say the last best hope is really the judge. So it was interesting to me to watch the judge's decisions in both of these cases, given the evidence that was presented to them. So the example that I wanna give you all that I saw where uh, access to justice wasn't equal based on financial situations. I had a client who I was representing in a probate matter. Um, his father passed away in January and he was uh, trying to administer the estate. During the course of me handling his probate case, he informed me that he also had a family law case occur. And the family law case was based on um, an allegation that he wasn't paying his alimony on time. Now this is an older gentleman, he's retired. So he was supposedly in arrears on his alimony. He has grown adult children, retired older gentlemen. Now the reason for him not paying his uh, alimony is because he lost his father in January. And unbeknownst to me, he also lost his brother in uh, um, August, not October, he lost him in August. So he lost his brother in August and he had to bury his brother lost his father in January and had to bury his father. He tried to explain to the judge that, you know, I know I owe her this money, but I just had these losses in my family and I wasn't able to pay this expense. Mind you, his arrearage, um, the time that he fell behind on his alimony occurred right after he lost his brother. So you see why he wasn't paying the alimony. And he also explained this to the court and had it documented. Well, the judge informed him or the opposing counsel informs him, whichever one you want to claim, that he had no obligation to bury his father or to bury his brother. There was no court order in effect that would require him to do that or to pay for those finances, but he was required to pay for his alimony. Now my client represented himself at that hearing and he was more taken back by how he was treated during the hearing. This is a, a sophisticated man. He was a professor at Barry, etc. And I didn't understand the gravity of what happened to him until I actually read the court's order. And the court put in their order that 
because he had no obligation to bury his father and to bury his brother, he should have paid the child support, the uh, alimony. And if he didn't pay the total arrears, which was almost like 10,000 in total, then he was going to be put in jail within 24 hours. So to say that there was some procedural concerns with that case is to say it mildly. And to say that this all occurred shortly after George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, at the height of Black Lives Matter, everybody was protesting the gall of this situation. My client, an African-American man who represented himself pro se against an opposing counsel who did not necessarily look like him and a judge who did not necessarily look like him. Where was the justice? So where we're looking at how justice plays out in the system, we're not just talking about the criminal justice system, we're talking about the legal system in general because we see it happening in our civil cases as well. And I think people tend to misunderstand that when we're talking about civil, we're not just talking about folks with big money, we're talking about these family law cases like I just explained to you guys and we're talking about the probate cases. If my client didn't come to me and explain to me the situation and didn't enlist my help, if he didn't come up with that money, the $10,000, he would have been in jail within 24 hours. Where is the justice? Well, uh, thanks for uh, bringing that, that up because the justice should be across the board, civil and criminal. In my considered judgment, if you're in Miami-Dade County, really in the Southern District of Florida, there are two areas where you kind of safe. If you are dirt poor and get a public defender, or if you got a lot of resources, if you're a hardworking everyday person living from paycheck to paycheck, middle class, you're in trouble because the average middle class person, they're trying to bury their family. They're trying to feed their family. They're trying to send the kids to school and stuff. They don't have 5,000, 7,000, 10,000, whatever for a case. The pub, we have some of the best public defenders offices in the country, both state and federal. And so that's why you have a lot of people not telling the whole truth about the assets because I want a public defender. You know, when it first started, they no, don't, whatever you do, don't give me a public defender. They're lying now to get a public defender because they'll fight for them. I had a case real quickly uh, of similar to one Don had where my client was charged with the biggest homicide in Broward County right around the same time. And his father knew my father. My father, honestly, not made me, but challenged me. I had to represent him. He had taken someone to a place where his wife was, where the, uh, his friend's wife was, and he killed four people. My client's in the truck. The judge, you, you uh, L'Oreal said, the judge should be the should be the the like the final arbiter of justice. The judge wore handcuffs for his tie pin, and called the Florida Highway Patrol from the uh, bench every day telling her about what's going on in the case. I had to try the case against the judge and the prosecutor. I convinced the jury that my client was responsible for some crime, but not the murders. They recommended life. The judge gave him death, took it to the Supreme Court, waited 17 months to the Supreme Court reversed in a landmark case about you can't split a jury up once they uh, start deliberating. And I was felt so good until I realized, oh my goodness, I gotta try this case again in front of that same hanging judge. Tried it again, person's convicted again, jury gave life again, judge gave death again, took it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, reversed and he's still alive. But those kind, I want people to understand who are not in the criminal justice system. Those things happen all the time. We have judges on this call, on this meeting right now who are good and decent people who are sentencing people to crimes that I'm sure they go home and cry about because it's minimum mandatory. You shoot a, shoot a gun, you don't touch anybody. They say you shot the gun, you gotta get 20 minimum, minimum mandatory. What? Uh, just before they changed the law, they sent us a white guy for an amount of crack uh, cocaine and then a black guy come with the same amount of crack. They had to send him to one 
hundred times stiffer sentence. These are good people. The system is rotten. Thank you. And then if I could opine too, uh, real quick, uh, and then we can go on because I know we have other clips to watch. Uh, I tell anyone, whether you're in a law school or about to graduate, that if you really wanna help keep black and brown people out of jail, it's probably best to become a prosecutor because you do bring the charges versus a PD. Um, I don't know if that, that uh, sentiment was shared uh, with Don when he started off. Um, in some ways, I, I know a lot of people are thinking about it now, but if you can ensure that people don't have trumped up charges or being overcharged, then you can ensure that those kinds of people will stay out of jail as well. So I think that's right. important to keep in mind when working- Real, real quickly, not only the Don, we need people police chiefs like the chief we have on the day. We need prosecutors, probation officers, judges, every aspect of the criminal justice system. But we don't need just people who are black. We need people who are good, black, yes. good, yes. white, yes. good, Hispanic. Yes. Yes. Same thing with the police force. It should yes. be good people and good police versus bad people and bad police. And that's not what we have now. Um, thank you all. We're going to move into our next clip. It's easy to see this case as one man trying to prove his innocence. But when you take a black man and you put him on death row a year before his trial and exclude black people from serving on his jury, when you base your conviction on the coerced testimony of a white felon and ignore the testimony of two dozen law-abiding black witnesses, when any evidence proving his innocence is suppressed and anyone who tries to tell the truth is threatened, this case becomes more than the trial of just a single defendant. It becomes a test of whether we're going to be governed by fear and by anger or by the rule of law. The people standing in the back of this courtroom are all presumed guilty when accused. If they have to leave here and live in fear of when this very thing will happen to them. If we're just going to accept the system that treats you better, if you're rich and guilty, than if you're poor and innocent, then we can't claim to be just. If we say we're committed to equal justice under law to protecting the rights of every citizen, regardless of wealth, race, or status, then we have to end this nightmare for Walter McMillan and his family. The charges against them have been proven to be a false construction of desperate people, fueled by bigotry and bias, who ignored the truth in exchange for easy solutions, and that's not the law. That's not justice. That's not right. So for those of you had, that have not heard about the Walter McMillan case, um, it's basically where an African-American man um, in the late 80s was accused and convicted of a crime that he did not commit. He was put on death row before his trial. Um, it was just a, a ridiculous case. And Brian Stevenson, who started the Equal Justice Initiative, um, was his attorney and Michael B. Jordan is playing him in the film and that is his closing um, his closing argument. So I pose this question to the panelists and we're gonna end on this before we take questions from the audience. Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice, Justice Initiative believe that we are all more than the worst thing we've ever done. What does this quote mean to you after watching the film? What would it mean to live in a world where the criminal justice system reflects this statement? And we'll start with L'Oreal. No pressure. Thank you, Zabria. Um, it's definitely a statement of re redemption, right? We are definitely more than the worst thing we've ever done. Regardless of what you've done in your past, regardless of how you've fallen short, there is still opportunity for you to get back up. That's not a cliche. That means that you learn from that mistake and you work to improve, to better yourself, to move forward. So you can't, you shouldn't be judged on that one mistake. You should be judged on how you took that challenge and turned it into the triumph. Imagine what 
what our society will look like if law enforcement lived and abided by that same mentality. The chief kind of alluded to it when she said some of these police chiefs should be honest about the description of what their police officer did incorrectly. If all of law enforcement throughout the nation recognized the history that HT just enlightened you on and told you that yes, we were part of the Klan, yes, we were infiltrated, we know that that's our dirty little secret, just like this dirty institution called uh, slavery that America tried to brush under the carpet that we're seeing bubbling up to the surface, if we actually acknowledge those atrocities and we can actually heal from those atrocities, if you found some sort of contrition and really try to make amends or atone for the ill-fated decisions, whatever the reasons may be that you made them, then we could actually move forward in a more progressive manner. If we could acknowledge that there was disparate treatment of, against African-Americans at the hands of law enforcement, and if law enforcement could take active steps to correct those disparate treatments, imagine, imagine what a society would look, what we would be in. I've said before, if they actually, they, law enforcement, actually implemented President Obama's blueprint from 2008 and actually implemented the community policing that's outlined there, dare say we wouldn't be in this situation today. You all can feel free to chime in. Don? Okay, uh, Debria, the thought that came to my mind when that comment was made in the movie, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I thought about the guy who was electrocuted in the movie, who actually received the death penalty, the former veteran who was had PTSD, but again, didn't have the resources, didn't have the right kind of attorney. So a whole bunch of defenses that could have been available to him, a whole bunch of, a bunch of mitigation that could have been available to him that might have avoided him from getting a death penalty was not there. And with all the stuff that he'd done, he says, I put that bomb there, but she wasn't supposed to come by. I didn't intend to kill anybody. And even though he had killed someone, there was more to him than that one bad act. So as I listen to HT talk about uh, some of these uh, cases where, you know, people get sent away to prison on minimum mandatories, uh, I'm trusting that that's more Broward and federal, uh, because if you've got people who are being dedicated prosecutors true to their calling, they are recognizing they've got this person maybe on the, the, the one bad day in their entire life. They've never had any other criminal activity, but the one thing they did was bad, but there is still redemption for them. So let's do what is just. And oftentimes in our office, that means that minimum mandatory is going to be waived, whether it's a gun case, whether it's a uh, drug trafficking case, and you see what's happening in Broward, they've got a number of cases they're reviewing where they sent people away uh, for decades on drug trafficking stuff. So that didn't happen here in Dade County because we just use our discretion differently. The rules are different here because we've got a different mindset. We're not just looking to, to, to fulfill rules. You get the, the weight, you got the numbers, we're gonna ship you away, no. There is chances for redemption. Everybody's entitled to a second chance. And to the extent we can do that, we try to do that in our office. I try to help Catherine Fernandez Rundle in setting the tone uh, for the office and those kinds of principles because they lead to unfortunate results when you don't have that. As prosecutors, we have got to be the gatekeepers for bad behavior anywhere. If you've got a bad police officer who is engaged in inappropriate behavior, we need to be able to figure that out. And once we do, we're not filing that case. If we file the case and we find it out during the course of the, the investigation or during the pendency of that trial, we're dropping the case. Uh, and then look at going after the police officer because we have got to do everything we can to make sure that everybody is being treated fairly. I tell my prosecutors in training, you have the power as prosecutors 
to destroy people's lives. And you've got to recognize that every case you handle, you need to make sure you're treating people fairly, that you're doing the right thing and you're making the right decision and you're doing it for the right reason. The, the, the problem is that there are still people who are fit in the system with power, prosecutors, judges, police officers, who see us as not subhuman, but less and that our lives don't matter. This is why black lives, that's what a beautiful statement, black lives matter. So I'm representing a black man who's charged with a rape. The prosecutor, and I'm not gonna tell you whether it's in Dade or Broward, prosecutor insisted a minimum of 25 years. Now I'm representing a white person in the same jurisdiction with rape of an 80 year old woman multiple types of, of things that he did to this woman. Without me asking the prosecutor, the prosecutor came to me and offered three years, three. This is the first time as a defense lawyer, I wouldn't say, hell no, he got to get more than that till I realized this is my client. <laughs> I said, wait, 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 wait HC, don't get carried away. Yeah, we'll take the three, but you got to, this is ridiculous. I represented a guy who rep, uh, 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 broke, I'm sorry, robbed the McDonald's that's closest to the Justice Building. It's got to be mandatory 10 years. I represented a white cop who committed eight robberies. And, and if anybody's interested, after we get off, I can give you the name so you can see, because it was obvious all through the press. The, they offered five years. I didn't even ask. He eight robberies, five years. Well, HT, he used to be a cop. Look at all the good things he did. Now, that's what Don is talking about, a holistic look, look at the person. But it should be not just for cops. It should not just be for whites. It should be for everybody. Because, Brian Stevenson said, we are all, including myself, I am better than the worst thing I ever did, too. And thank God I got mercy. Amen. Amen. Listen, I don't know how I follow that up, but I'm gonna try to say a couple words here towards the end. Uh, we, we really, the, the main thing that I think comes down, it comes down to, and I think first and foremost, Michael B. Jordan did a terrific job as Brian Stevenson in that movie. Um, I hadn't watched it until I watched it for this because in, in large part, it's a very emotional thing. Um, obviously doing police oversight, I try to protect my energy as much as possible. Uh, but that being said, when, when we talk about value and the value of a human being and, and the value of what uh, America has said our worth is, uh, we often don't see that reflected in our criminal justice system. And I think the only way for us to ensure that that does happen is, is pushing people into uncomfortable spaces. It's by ensuring that in the jobs that we work each and every day, uh, that we're working towards more practical and pragmatic approaches that ensure that we win the things that we're saying are important. Uh, far too often, uh, we compromise things that shouldn't be compromisable. Uh, far too often, uh, we go right up to the line, but we don't cross it because we're fear of being judged the wrong way. We have to be willing to get dirty in some of these situations to ensure that our value, the things that America has promised to us, is being uh, uh, given to us in a meaningful way. Um, and, and I think uh, the lives of HT and, and, and Don and everyone else on this call, to an extent, have proven that to be true, that when we demand uh, uh, certain things or when we when we speak up when things are wrong things do change uh, we saw just this week now that we have uh, uh, oversight of the Miami-Dade Police Department here in the county for the first time in over 10 years that when people stand up people do listen um, and that's the kind of value that we're talking about we're not talking about something so romanticized and so lofty we don't have to sit around and read Plato's Republic to understand what it means to live in a democracy that says that you are are a valued human being. Um, and, and I think far too often we, lo we lose uh, eyesight of that. I think, uh, especially with our police too. Um, far too often I, I, I look at police officers who are, who are ready to go fight uh, ab about their jobs uh, or that are ready to, to say it's this or nothing else. Or there's other people that uh, confront me and say, you know, th th this is you against us. Like they make it very, very deep. But really we're just talking about a job. Policing is a job. People lose their job every day, right? And you just tell yourself, hey, you know, this wasn't meant for me, onto something else. Yeah, daddy did it, but just wasn't my MO. Um, I serve in the military because my dad served in the military. And if for whatever reason I couldn't do it or uphold that family legacy, okay, well, I guess this wasn't for me. 
You know, we're not talking about your life. We're not talking about uh, something that you can't change, an immutable characteristic. We're talking about a job. And I think when we boil it down to something of that level, we can say, you know what? You know, maybe I should move on to something else. This isn't for me. I don't have to go fight and, and, and uh, you know, go to court and do all these things that we're seeing now uh, in the media or all these kinds of reforms. If we can just look at policing and say, hey, this is your, this is a job. You are bad at it. Move on. Um, and I think when we boil simplistic things down to that level and when we latch on to harder things that have the essence of our value, those are the important things. And those are the things our systems represent. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you all. Uh, it's 7.30, so we're going to take a Q question. We're going to jump right into our Q&A. Uh, so the first question that I saw come in that I want to ask says, what is currently the greatest modern challenge in organizing Black professionals in the legal uh, or justice system? Um, so anyone take a quick stab. We want to limit our response to try to get a few questions in. I'll jump in on that one. Um, I think it's getting them out of the office, is getting them away from the billable hours, is getting them out of the courtroom um, in front of those long trials and getting them engaged. It's not that they don't want to be engaged. It's not that uh, there's not a desire there. Some folks don't necessarily know how to jump in or when to jump in. Um, the young attorneys at Don's office, for example, they're trying to figure out how to be an attorney. The young attorneys at the PD's office, they're trying to figure out how to be an attorney first and foremost, so they can't even navigate anything else. Then you have the other attorneys in the larger, larger firms who are concerned about those billable hours and don't necessarily uh, have the bandwidth to take on the issues. But the problem on both ends of that spectrum is that we have to understand that these issues have to be addressed. And if not by you, then by who? And if these, these issues continue to affect one of us in our community, they're going to affect all of us. You are not insulated because you moved to the suburbs. You are not insulated because you hold a certain title or position. You too are still a black person in America. So the issue with organizing um, our young professionals is one, they're too preoccupied. But the other thing is that folks are working in silos, which is what we saw with the JDI that HT referenced earlier, the Judicial Diversity Initiative. That initiative came about because we saw that people were working individually on the same issue when we are more powerful as a collective. So there are several uh, organizations who are trying to address the issues of police reform, but they're working in their silos. And I won't name them by name, but you all know what I mean and who I'm referring to. Instead of us coming together to be a collective and really yielding our collective power and strength, we are very segmented and are not harmonized in that regard. And sometimes it's just because the right hand don't know what the left hand is doing because we're not communicating. So we have to effectively communicate, unite, see the commonality as Rodney uh, pointed out and understand that these issues, the talent intent is incumbent upon you to take up this mantle that was handed down by HT and Don and to carry the torch forward. We are lawyers. We are trained to lead and we are called to serve. Our community is calling out for us desperately because almost all the matters that they're seeing now through these cell phones, through the social media, there's some important legal uh, component to it. So who should they be looking to? They're looking to us. So we should be working with people like Chief Noel Pratt, who's trying to do it the right. I mean, it, this doesn't take a lot of, of uh, meetings. Street law, it's done in New York. Ray Tassif, a lawyer that you all know, he did it up, he was involved in it in New York. We take their, their uh, curriculum and tweak it to fit Miami or Dade County. We have uh, organizations throughout the zip codes that we know uh, need this information. We train the leaders and the leaders train the, the rest of the people. 
We know who the good guys are in the state attorney's office. We find a way to work together. The chief has programs already. She told us about it. She's working. Explorer is a program. We don't have to invent anything. Look, leadership is worth its weight in gold. Why did the black lawyers lead the highly successful boycott Miami campaign? Because the community said, we need somebody to do something about having Nelson Mandela dissed. Who was trained to lead? We were. Who called, who responded to the call? We did. Now, this is the first time since it, between 1863 and 1877 that black issues are to the forefront where blacks are very proud to be black again, where whites allies are waiting, want to help us. But the helping hands that we need are at the end of our own arms. Yes, I have a lot of white allies and friends but I'm not depend. That's icing on the cake. I'm the cake, and so I'm saying to Wilkie D. Ferguson Bar Association, Caribbean Bar Association, Haitian Lawyers Association, Gwen Cherry Bar Association, uh, Malcolm Cunningham Bar Association, T.J. Reddick Bar Association, do something. And one, one, okay, you're good. Oh, go ahead, Rodney. Now, one thing I was saying is very, very short is that um, obviously, and I mentioned this in the chat too, on a very short amount, um, that I think money is also a barrier to uh, having more, uh, you know, diverse people in the legal profession. Obviously, it costs a lot of money to go to law school. It costs a lot of money to take the bar and so on and so forth. It would be good if we can get to the root causes of why education is so expensive, but that's a different uh, Zoom for another time. But another thing that, that I want to um, throw in here is that it's also important that we surround ourselves uh, with what I call a board of directors, people that will encourage us, that will mentor us, that will give us the advice that we need so that when opportunity does present itself, we can act on those things. I I'll never forget when I first moved to the city almost three and a half years ago, one of the first people I met was H.T. Smith in his, in his office. Uh, my director had brought me to meet him and I never forget some of the first things he told me, so much so that I actually hand wrote him a letter afterwards because people that seek out that age old wisdom is really worth its weight in gold as well. And, and they give you information and insight. And I'll never forget, you know, he, he told me like, listen, Rodney, if you, if you wanna hunt the buffalo, go to where they are and win, right? Because at this point in time in history, we have to make sure that everything that we do counts. You gotta put points on the board because people are counting on you. And I think some of that sage old wisdom is necessary in so many ways that some people don't get on the everyday. So you have to surround yourself by, by those kinds of people. And it doesn't have to be the talented temp or anything crazy like that. It can just mean people that, hey, uh, we uh, think, uh, think similarly. Uh, hey, maybe I see something in you. Maybe we can work with each other. I think the common good is something that's representative of most people. And when we remember that you don't need to be talented or super smart or anything else like that. You just got to have a good heart. And you got to be gritty and you have to really want to speak truth to power. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Don, this next question is specifically for you. It says, will the SAO be implementing changes to speed up police shooting investigations? Five years, example, Homestead case is way too long. And what other cases does the SAO wait for years because it wants to talk, talk to every possible witness? Well, I think that's a question for Don Horn. I, I hope that they're going to speed up some police, uh, police involved situations and cases. One thing I can say is that, you know, the state attorney does like to take cases that they believe they can win. I'm of the opinion that they should probably take some cases of first impression. Maybe we can get some case law that changes or that kind of interprets the police bill of rights differently. Um, I think a lot of things uh, that are in the law enforcement officers bill of rights makes it very hard to prosecute an officer. Uh, but I think some of those things can be interpreted differently. Um, uh, there's a, obviously a lot of conversation around qualified immunities right now. I, I think the, you know, one can make an argument that the police officer's bill of rights shouldn't apply in certain circumstances, where an officer has been charged with a heinous action. Um, we see that in uh, police officer pensions uh, legislations all the time. Uh, so I think there's some creative ways to do that, but obviously I think Don would be probably better to answer. A couple of things. I'm familiar with the case that's 
five years old because I'm the one who's going to be closing it out because the people who went out on the police shooting left the office and then it was taken over by somebody else and they left the office and now as a co-chair of the committee, I'm going to get it done. And there's still one last witness I want to make sure we speak to because the family provided him to us and said he was an eyewitness. And so I want to make sure that we have uh, gotten all of the uh, essential information uh, that will that will be involved in our analysis. So Rodney, to your comment about uh, doing a, a, a test case, we can't treat police shootings any differently than anything else. Our obligation as prosecutors is if I got it and I got sufficient evidence, we're going to file it. I don't care who the defendant is. I don't care what the charge is. That is always going to be the standard regardless of what the situation is. My oath doesn't change based on who the defendant is. But as you know, oftentimes we are in situations where there's a dead person and there's a police officer. And the only people who know about what happened is a dead person, a police officer, and the dead person ain't talking. And we sometimes have those kinds of situations where, OK, where's the evidence of what happened? We don't know. So how are we going to file um, uh, charges? Uh, in, in other situations, the police officer who's involved in a shooting is entitled to Fifth Amendment protections just like everybody else. And if he or she chooses to invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege and say, no, I'm not going to give a statement, then again, oftentimes we have no way of knowing what happened in a specific situation unless there are other witnesses, civilians, or other witness officers. And sometimes that is how we're getting information. But as you know from what you do, uh, which is a civil uh, investigation panel, a lot of the laws we have in place are written to protect police officers in the dangerous job that they do. And they have a lot of discretion and the law gives them the ability to use deadly force just like they do to us with stand your ground because we've got people now who are killing folks who under the old law would have been prosecuted. But now some of the, the protections that are available to us as civilians are almost as high as the uh, deadly force, the use of deadly force that's available to police officers and, 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 and had been. Uh, and that's the struggle we have. And oftentimes we have looked at these cases and gone, this was absolutely unnecessary, but it's lawful. And if it's lawful, then we can't file charges because it, 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 it's a horrible position to be in. But we have got to remain true to the law on every case, regardless of who the defendant is, regardless of where the charges are. And at the end of the day, it would not be justice. Okay, I've got to speak up. Don Horn is a brilliant trial lawyer. And although he hasn't tooted his own horn, horn, pun intended, horn tooting his horn, uh, he's one of the few prosecutors in Florida who has gotten a conviction against a police officer for shooting a black man. I saw the trial, he was brilliant. Don Horn is fair, but I expected him to go a little further I expected Don Horn to say, we have all these hurdles. We got the police officers, Bill of Rights, we got the unions, but yes, some of these cases we are taking too long. We can, we can do this thing. We can, we, we, the community is demanding that we do it faster and we're going to, within our office, we're going to meet and we see how we can streamline it and still be thorough. Let me tell you, they damn sure don't take five years to investigate when my client shoots somebody. Usually it's five hours. And I'm in there the next day trying to get him out of jail. <laughs> so I understand with the police officer is different because if any of you read the police officer's Bill of Rights, and I and I suggest to you, some of you do, uh, chapter 112, 532, in the, okay? Look at it. You won't believe all the rights they've given police officers. Let me tell you, I want police officers to be protected. You know, people talking about defund the police. If somebody break in my house, I'm not calling Starbucks. I'm calling the police. I'm calling Chief Noel Pratt, okay? Now, should things be changed? Should they be dealing with homeless? No. Should they be dealing with mentally ill? No. But they should be dealing with people who uh, with crime situations. So I am hopeful that sometime in the very near future, Don Horn's boss, Catherine Fernandez Rundle, will say, after reviewing this, we now believe that we have been a little slow on some of these and we're gonna speed this thing up because the community demands it and we can do it. The last thing is this, when my client is being investigated, not Don Horn, I don't think Don and I have ever had a case together and that's good for my clients. 
I'd rather go up against somebody I know I can beat. This would be a real struggle. I don't need a struggle. But when they get ready to arrest my client, you know what they tell me? We arrested your client, HT, because we had probable cause. But for the police, they say, I hear, we couldn't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, Don, if I'm saying that inaccurately, we are friends. I want you to straighten me out. But they arrest my client on probable cause. You heard recently on a case of high, pro, uh, a high profile that the state attorney said, I did not file charges because we could not prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. So if I'm if I'm out of line, if I misinterpret her, please tell me, because I, I think it should be like you said, Don, it should be the same for police and non-police. You, you are absolutely correct, HT. And although the standard for police to make an arrest is probable cause, we have people getting arrested for probable cause every day and their case is getting to our office and we're making an analysis and determining, yeah, there was probable cause, but we do not have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We are no action in the case, not filing it. That's burglaries, that's rape, that's, that's, that's drug cases, that's all manner of things, including police officer cases, because we can't file it if we can't prove it. And the standard is not going to change at trial. It's always going to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so everybody going to get arrested by police officers, not based on our standard, but by the police standard of probable cause. And to your point about the uh, the uh, time frame for the police shooting, I've forgotten about that aspect of the question. But yes, this five years is an outlier. What has changed significantly is through Kathy's involvement, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is now the primary investigating agency for all the police uh, uh, departments here in Dade County. They are getting their investigations closed out sooner. We are getting our investigations closed out sooner. And now we are getting most of these cases closed out in less than a year. So Debria and Jamal, please send me a copy of this tape so that when my client get arrested for probable cause and it's not beyond a reasonable doubt, I can go to his subordinates and tell them, listen to what your boss say. Drop this charge against my client. Thank you. But remember, we don't control the police department. <laughs> you don't control them. You told me once they make the arrest, you decide okay. whether you're going to prosecute. Oh, oh absolutely. So absolutely. And, and I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to play this. I'm just going to play this videotape. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We got a lot of great feedback and a lot of questions in the QA on Zoom and as well as Facebook. This was just part one of the discussion in which we wanted to address the blatant misconduct that happened on behalf of the police and the um, criminal justice system um, in both of these films, which the themes of these films are very prevalent to what is occurring now um, in society. Part two of this discussion will happen next month and it will be addressing Know Your Rights with which a lot of the questions in the comments um, were concerning and wanted, a lot of people wanted feedback on different things that uh, HT gave uh, different scenarios that Don gave, different scenarios that Rodney gave. So we want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Like I said, there will be a part two to this discussion um, addressing Know Your Rights. And we're going to let Travis um, give closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Debria. We would like to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight and engaging in this discussion. Tonight, we were able to discuss criminalization and inequality racial bias, power and positionality, rights and justice and humanity, issues that minority communities, especially the black community struggles with at the hands of law enforcement and the legal system. We'd like to thank our partners, Deb Foundation and Albert Wilson Foundation in joining us to present this program tonight. We do these programs in order to add to and expand upon the conversations taking place around the world surrounding social justice and equality by exploring the themes addressed in these films, Just Mercy and When They See Us. As Kelsey J, the Debs Foundation Executive Director of Organizational Development has stated, we understand that art and entertainment have a special role in presenting narratives of social justice and equality, then that too is activism. Facilitating questions like this with professionals who take on these issues every day is one of our movement gifts. And we hope that it inspires our audience to dream big and become change agents. Now we would like to thank our audience, ask our audience members to move forward and become those change agents. H.T. Smith gave us some wonderful ideas and instructions on how we can begin to effectuate those chains. So we say thank you to our panelists. 
L'Oreal Arscott, Don Horn, Rodney Jacobs, Chief Delma Noel Pratt, and H.T. Smith. We would also like to thank our moderators, Jabria Bradshaw and Jamal May. And finally, we'd like to thank our audience for participating in this program tonight. We look forward to continuing this conversation to address the rot in the system and in continuing our efforts to become those agents of change. My name is Travis Randolph, and on behalf of the Wilby D. Ferguson Junior Bar Association, I thank you all for participating in our program tonight. today. Have a good evening and good night.